Welcome back to Crosstalk. I am very excited about today's program because it will reveal a new name for God, something that the Israelites didn't know about him yet, and he's revealing to them who he really is. Well, maybe you already know this about me, but I am from Argentina. And uh, not long ago, we had the World Cup in South Africa. And you know, people from Argentina are crazy about soccer. And this is the hat I was wearing at 4.30 in the morning because <laughs> I had to watch games very early because it was a time change. And this uh, was my shirt. So we have a thing in soccer, you know, that we do, that <laughs> we wear our flag. You know, there, there's very, very, very few things like sports to unite us. Actually, uh, if you've ever been to the Olympics or watched the Olympics or, or watched a World Cup of soccer or anything like that, you'll see how people rally uh, behind their flag. And it's like the, the whole country is... Uh, I don't know, living through their sports people. They, they, they yell every goal, and, and if you're in the Olympics, you know, you feel so proud when, in my case, the United States wins a gold medal or something, even though I am not good at all in any of the sports. Somehow, you realize you belong to that team because that's your country. Well, today I want to reveal to you what happened the day that the people of Israel learned that God was their flag. Once they understood, really, that um, the whole, <laughs> you know, the whole journey would be under this one standard, and the standard was God himself and his power. So in so many ways, this would be their flag from there on. They would have to learn that the Lord, Yahweh, was their flag, their standard. Perhaps you've seen... Um, Medieval times. I'm sure you have seen some of the games they do from medieval times. The, the, the medieval um, armies had a standard that would go in front of them with a horse and a pole, and they would have their flag because that meant we are this team. We belong to this particular group. Now, many times in the, in the Bible times, when, when people conquered a country, they would come in to conquer, and they would bring their gods as a flag. So uh, some of the saddest things for the Jews was when they were conquered, and those oppressors or the people that were conquering them brought their uh, gods with a small g, who they said, see, they have given us this country or this nation or this city. Because the gods supposedly were the ones that were giving them the power, and therefore they would say, see, our God is bigger than your God. So you know the concept of flag. You know the concept of a standard. You know, and I, being originally from Argentina, you know, many times, now I have two flags. I have the flag of Argentina and the flag of the United States <laughs> because I'm a citizen of the United States. Well, there was a time when Israel... Um, was learning who God was. And the, in our previous program, we talked about when God revealed that he was their healer. Remember Yahweh, Rophe? But now they start getting a whole different set of problems. See, when they left the Red Sea, and they were pumped up and they, woohoo, of Exodus 15, Yahweh is a warrior and wa Yahweh is a redeemer and Yahweh is this and Yahweh is that. They had really not started with all their problems yet. As a matter of fact, they started with internal problems, inside problems. No water, no bread, and then God revealed to them, I'm your healer, Yahweh Rophe. But today we will learn another name of God that has to do with flags. It has to do with banners. It has to do with standards. 
And it came about when they met the first problem from the outside. Not just problems that they were having, what they were going to eat or drink. It came when they uh, didn't know how to fight an enemy. It's the first fight of the Israelites since they left Egypt. So if you are at home and would like to join us with your Bible, please start on Exodus chapter 17, verse 8. Um, let's, let's start reading it so we can discuss who these people were. Verse 8. Then Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. Okay, let's stop there for a moment. Um, Amalek is a whole different flag <laughs> than Israel. Okay, so think about it for a moment. If, if, if this is Argentina and we have the flag of the United States uh, playing soccer, you will know, okay, today we are playing against them. But just for today because it's a sport, right? Well, that's not the way it was with Amalek. The Amalekites would be in war with Israel from the beginning of the Bible <laughs> till much later in the Bible. I mean, there is this enmity, enmity between Esau and Jacob. And the Amalekites are descendants of Esau. Do you remember back in Genesis when Jacob and Esau, the twin brothers, are already fighting in the womb? And, and their mother is going... Oh, God, why did you do this to me? I waited for so long to have a child, and here I have two people inside of me fighting already, and they were not even born. Well, Esau and, and Jacob had this, I guess there's no other word than enmity. They, they were always against each other throughout the history of redemption, even their descendants. As a matter of fact, uh, when we get to the time of Esther, do you remember the book of Esther? If you don't know it, uh, go read it because it's so exciting. Here we have the Jews, and there is a man that wants to kill all the Jews. He's called Naaman the Agagite. And what you, you might be thinking, what does Agagite have to do with the Malachites? Where Agag was the most famous king of the Amalekites. So even then, all the way to uh, the end of the, of the Old Testament times, when, when they are in, in, in Persia and all of that, they're still, the Amalekites and the Israelites, they're still fighting. And Naaman is, is trying to exterminate the whole, the whole race of the Jews. Of course, many, many times uh, the devil, <laughs> because I'm sure that he was behind all this, was trying to exterminate the Jews because the Jews... Um, would have the Savior coming through their, their family. Jesus was a Jew. And so many times we find the Amalekites and the Israelites fighting, but this is the first formal fight that we have between two nations. Remember that we talked about the importance of seeing the Bible as a whole. So no matter what story you are learning, you, you place it in the history of salvation. Don't forget now, we are in the second part, in the Exodus part, and they just left Egypt. Okay, let's continue. Chapter 17 of Exodus, verse 8. Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, isn't that interesting because Joshua, I don't know, we haven't seen him before. <laughs> you know, the Bible has a way of, of bringing people in that you never heard of, and you got to go look for them. Who are they? Who, who, who is Joshua? We never seen Joshua in the Bible yet until this point. But it looks like he was already the military leader. And he says that Moses said to Joshua. Now, let me tell you a little detail about that. Did you know that Moses is the one that gave this name to Joshua? You know, if you, if you go to the book of Numbers that tells us what, um, what names he, he had, you will see uh, that he didn't have that name. In Numbers 13, he's called Hoshea, which means salvation. And Moses said, no, 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 no. You will not longer be called Hoshea. That simply means salvation. You're going to be called Joshua. That means Yahweh saves. It means we are not going to know, we're going to know where salvation comes from. So from now on, Joshua, you will be called Joshua. And this is a Hebrew uh, name that is the same of Jesus. Jesus and Joshua are the same name 
um, one is in Greek, one is in Hebrew. Yeshua is in Hebrew, uh, Yesu is in Greek. And so here we have Moses said to Joshua, which by the name already we get an introduction to the, to the fight. Yahweh says, don't forget, just by the name of the military leader. It's like if, we, if I had a CEO that says, Yahweh will save us. <laughs> Isn't that a great name to, to lead your army? Moses said to Joshua, choose men for us and go out and fight against Amalek. So everybody's getting their uniforms on, their flag on, their hats on, their, their, their whatever they were using, shields or whatever else they were using, and they're ready to fight. But they can't get mistaken of where will the power come from. They can't be mistaken. See, many times when we talk about flags and, 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 and other things, we, we wonder, okay, is it the power of our nation? Is it, is, what is it? So that we know, okay, this is Argentina. We don't have much power, but anyways. You know, where is it coming from? I, I, in my youth, I went through the very sad experience of the Falkland Islands uh, when we had a war against England uh, back in, in the Falk, uh, whew, what was it, 1980s. And it was a very sad time for us and to see the flag. And people were wearing so proudly their flag, even though, you know, we were being destroyed. And here, Israel starts getting ready for battle. They start putting their flags, their hats, their shields, their spears, whatever they were using at that time. But God says, look, I got to teach you where power comes from because I'm going to start revealing myself to you more and more that any fight you ever have throughout history, including how we're saved, you must know that it doesn't come from you. It comes from the Lord. And so we continue. Verse 9 of chapter 17 of Exodus. Choose men for us and go out. Fight against Amalek. Tomorrow, I will station myself in the top of the hill with a staff of God in my hand. Okay, the staff was actually an um, authenticated symbol of God's presence. Don't forget that the staff had already been used uh, to cross the Red Sea and many other things that had already happened. So I'm going to use this that I used at the beginning as, as my staff for now. So Moses was supposed to go with the staff. Joshua, whose name means Yahweh saves, was supposed to be there. So the whole thing has very meaningful names and very meaningful symbols. And we haven't gotten to battle yet. So it says here, take the staff of God. I will take the staff of God, says Moses. And so Joshua did as Moses told him. And he fought against Amalek. And there also were Moses and Aaron and Hur. Now it's interesting because Hur is supposedly the son of Caleb. Okay, remember Caleb, one of the spies? And so here we have her, Aaron, and Moses. But Moses is up on the hill and Joshua is down there fighting. Very, <laughs> very interesting. Very interesting because Joshua is the one that has to fight and his name is Yahweh saves. But Moses is, is, is standing up there on the hill and God is about to teach them something. And this is what he's about to teach them. He's about to teach them that all the glory and the power come from above. That even though God uses human instruments, they're not the ones that have the strength and the power. Even if they're the choicest of, I don't know if that word even exists, of, of warriors. If Joshua will bring the best men to fight, but that's still not where power is coming from. So God says, okay, go and fight. Verse 12, but they discover something. Moses' hands were heavy. Then they took a stone <clears throat> and put it under him. So he said, okay, I'm going to sit down because I'm getting tired, says Moses. And this is what he discovered. He sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other side, so that his hands may be steady until the sun set. Why did they do that? Because they realized that when the hands were down, pointing to Joshua and the people down there, they started to lose. But when Moses was pointing up, they would win. 
It was, it was the way that God was starting to teach them in this developmental understanding of who God is. That the power really always comes from above. Deliverance is from above. Strength is from above. The way out is from above. So that they would never think, oh, look at us. We're so strong. Joshua, no, Joshua, you're no longer Hoshea. Remember, you're not salvation. Your salvation comes from the Lord name, Joshua. Yahweh saves. So this thing went on. <laughs> I love the visual aids that God used for his people to say, hey, hey, look up. That's where salvation comes from. It's not down there. So Moses had to have his hands up. And so after they were down, let's, let's read it. Verse 13 of chapter 17 of Exodus. Joshua overwhelmed Amalek. You know, they really won. That's what it means. And his people. And verse 14, the Lord said to Moses, write it down in a book. Don't forget the victories that God has done for you so that you don't lose sight of the big picture. And Moses built an altar. And here we get our name. Moses built an altar, verse 15, and named it, the Lord is my banner. The Lord is my flag. The Lord is my standard. In Hebrew is Yahweh Nisi. Yahweh Nisi. The Lord is my standard. I didn't realize that he was the flag. He was the real thing. He was, he was the one that would give us power and strength. I, 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 I didn't realize that. Actually, he didn't realize. That's why he kept pointing up. Because for a while, he put his hands down and you know, they were losing. So he says, wow, the Lord is my banner. The Lord is my flag. The Lord is my standard. And then they knew why they were winning. See, I think it's so interesting how God was actually training his people where salvation would come from. Don't forget that from Genesis to Revelation, it develops the power of the cross. And how is it that God actually uh, would bring salvation from above, outside the world. So God is teaching them. And here we have Yahweh Nisi. The Lord is our banner. We are, we are under him. And as long as we're under him, we're saved. What a beautiful visualization of who God was. You know, and this is not the first or last time that God had to direct their eyes up when they were in trouble. A few years later, they would actually struggle they, they would struggle with death. They had a fight, not with the Amalekites, but with death. And at that point, God had to teach them again to look up. Because see, we all have a tendency to fight our own battles. I, I, I'm not, I, I don't know about you, but I am the type of personality that when I was young, I had plan A, plan B, plan C. If something didn't work, I was just, you know, I had a solution. Woo, did God show me? God has taught me over the years to look up. And you know, they were fighting with death. Actually, let me show it to you. Let's go to the book of Numbers, chapter 21. This is when they got so tired. They said, you know, we were sick of this. Have you ever been there that you say these words? We hate everything. We hate this miserable food. We hate the desert. We are tired. And they spoke against God, says Numbers 21, 5. And they said, you know, we don't want anything else to do with you. And God said, okay. He removes the protection from them. And these venomous snakes come. You know, venomous snakes come <laughs> and they start biting the people and they start dying. It's, 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 it's the worst fight they ever have. And once again, they repent and they go to Moses and God gives them the, the, the strangest thing to do. They are supposed to bring up a standard. And you know what? It's the same name as the one we just learned. Yahweh Nisi. Remember, the Lord is my standard, is my banner, is my flag. They were supposed to bring up a, 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 a cross. And they were supposed to put a brown snake on it. You know, and, and they were supposed to lift it up. And it, the solution would be up again. They, they would not find solution inside of them for this venom. They, they had to look up at that serpent. And if they looked up, they would be healed. 
Many, many times. And you know, for me, it's very interesting that the word that God uses with Moses, build up a standard, is the same one that he taught them at the very beginning when Moses said, oh, now we realize the Lord is our standard. The Lord is our flag. The Lord is our power and our strength. He, we are in his team. He's our identity. You know, Jesus used the story of this standard later on. Remember in John 3, 16? He was explaining to Nicodemus that God so loved the world. And in chapter 14, two verses before, John 3, 14, he says, I'm going to teach you something, Nicodemus. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, well, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So that whoever actually looks at him will be saved. And then it says, for God so loved the world. See, many times God had to point up to standards, to solutions up there, because the solution wasn't in here. As a matter of fact, when we get to the prophets, now they get it, that all these were actually visualizations of who Jesus was. Oh, I tell you, I get so excited with the Bible because the whole Bible is one unit from beginning to end. Isaiah 11 is a chapter in which this, the, the, the Messiah is described. Uh, you know, we are told that he will reign, that he will be uh, from the stem of Jesse, you know, a Davidic king like David. You know, Jesse was David's father. And we're told how he's going to reign and all this kind of stuff. And look what it says in verse 10. In that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a standard for the people. And he uses the same word again. Now we understand that the Messiah is the standard. The Messiah is actually the flag. It's him. It's, he's the person. He's the standard. He's the banner. He's our identity. We're his team. He's the one that actually would work all deliverance on all salvation on our behalf. You know, it took God a while to teach this to Israel and to the prophets. And of course, to us. Because, oh, by the way, I know many of you are asking, why did God choose the serpent to represent Christ? Well, you know, the serpent in the Bible is always evil and the devil or something like that. Well, he made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that he could give us his righteousness. Second Corinthians 5 talks about that. And you know, I, um, I want to finish with this type of thought. Um, for whatever reason, we have this propensity to fight our own fights. For whatever reason, we forget that it is actually God who has fought for us and who has won. But on our daily lives, we also forget, and we still have a tendency to fight our own fights. And how wonderful it would be to remember this name, Yahweh Nisi, the Lord is my banner. So it's his glory, it's his honor, it's his strength and it's his power and it's his ability to deliver because he's my flag, my standard, my banner. That's who he is. Now, what is he to me? Oh, well, like all flags, he's my identity, he's my rallying point, he's my safety, and he's my refuge. I am under this flag, and the flag of the Christian is always the cross, because Yahweh Nisi, the Lord is my banner. So there are times in, lives, in, in our lives that we need to remember the same things that Israel learned that day. That even though God uses instruments that are human um, on this great controversy, even though he says, okay, Joshua, you got to go down there. That is never about us. That is never pointing at us. And look at me how strong I am and great skills I have. And I'm such a great Christian that God uses me. No, no, no. <clears throat> Don't be mistaken. It's all about God. It's all about the Christian flag that has the cross in it, because the cross is the, the, the flag of the Christian, is the standard, is that antidote that God figured out that day. And he said, you know what? I am going to have uh, this serpent that you're going to look at, and it's, it's gonna, you're going to look up. 
And, and the antidote is over there, it's not in here. It's, it's actually the antidote is up there. And in that way, you will always be pointing up with your hands. You will never say, ha ha, it's all about me. I'm it. No, says God, that's why I needed to reveal this name to you. Yahweh Nisi. You know the E at the end of Nisi means my. <laughs> Every time in Hebrew you see that E is usually the possessive of the first person. He's not just the banner of the Christian world. He's not just the Messiah that loved the world so much. He is my banner. He's my flag. He's my savior. He's my identity. And he's the one that has done for me what I could never do for myself. So in those days in which you're struggling with your own fights and you see Amalekites coming and they're stronger than you are and they're giants and they are skilled, remember Yahweh Nisi. I am your banner, says the Lord. The Lord is my banner. And perhaps those are the times in which you got to look up and point up and say, okay, Lord, this one's yours because <laughs> I really can't handle it. As a matter of fact, wouldn't it be great if we get into the habit of saying, okay, I'm going to grab a standard. I'm going to remember this is about him. And during those days in which I'm a little confused where the strength is going to come from, well, those days, I'm going to say, Yahweh Nisi, Yahweh Nisi, the Lord is my banner. He is my flag. He's my identity. He's my strength. He's my power. And those days that your hands are falling down, well, grab the Bible, open up, and see that the Messiah is your standard. He's the one that has the strength to bring you up. He really is the power of God unto salvation. So, this is cross talk. You know, in this, in this program, we always talk about Christ from Genesis to Revelation. We talk about him crucified and about all the visualizations that God gave his people throughout the redemption history so that they would never, ever forget who he was. And I hope it's the same for you. Never, never forget who he is. He's actually Yahweh Nisi.